Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I was really pleased to be giving the Kapuscinski uh, lecture. He was a towering figure. Um, I think for me, especially in those tumultuous times at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s when communism was collapsing and the Cold War was ending, but there were times that were full of optimism and hope. And I think we're now living through another period of tumultuous time, which unfortunately is a period of pessimism and fear. And that's really what I want to talk about. I mean, for someone of my generation, it's unthinkable that phenomena that I never thought I would see in my lifetime, such as, um, especially in the Middle East and Africa, but everywhere, such as refugees drowning in the Mediterranean, uh, such as the bombing, deliberate bombing of hospitals and schools, long distance assassination on a massive scale, killing people with lorries and aircraft, using hideous weapons that are prohibited by international law like chemical weapons, incendiaries, cluster munitions, beheading, torture, the reintroduction of sexual slavery. These were all just unthinkable only a few years ago. And how do we make sense of it? Um, I think it's particularly important for us here as Europeans because we're surrounded by powers that are actually contributing to these tragedies. Um, we're seeing the rise of xenophobia and racism and right-wing populism in the US, Russia, China, India, and also on our own continent. Uh, but nevertheless, even though we're seeing it inside the European Union, the European Union, as, as, as Werner just told us, does still represent a beacon of human rights and democracy. And I suppose the question that we're all grappling with, how can we sustain these values and what can we do to reverse these terrifying tendencies? And I want to... What I'm going to do in this lecture is to introduce the concept of security cultures as a way of <coughs> helping us make sense of what's happening. And um, I will make the argument that the kind of security culture that the European Union develops uh, will profoundly shape and be shaped by the kind of institution that the European Union becomes or doesn't become in the future. So I'll start with talking about what I mean by security cultures and then I will talk about the European common security and defense policy. So by security culture, I mean a way of doing security, a sort of combination of narratives, tools, practices, infrastructure, which embed certain styles of doing security. Um, I think in the Cold War period, we were dominant. There was only one way, at least internationally, of doing security, and that was geopolitics. Basically, external security policy consisted of the possession of regular armed forces designed to fight other states. Um, internal security, of course, varied from repression to um, rights-based policing, and there was, at least in our imaginations, a sharp distinction between what was internal security and what was external security. To some extent, UN peacekeeping represented an alternative outside security culture, the liberal peace, but it, during the Cold War, it was very insignificant. I think what's interesting now, and it represents the sort of turbulent transitional period that we're living through, is that we are seeing competing security cultures that actually blur the difference between inside and outside, and that's what I want to explain. So why did I develop this concept? Well, the starting point was the notion of what I call the security gap, a very simple 
question that turned out to be much more complicated to answer than I realized. And the simple question is, why is it that millions of people in the world live in conditions of deep insecurity, and yet our security services that mostly consist of regular armed forces not only don't address the problems they face, but in many cases make them worse. So that was my sort of, if you like, my research question. And I very quickly realized I was looking at apples and pears. And the problem with the word security is that it's a very ambiguous word. <laughs> On the one hand, it means safety. Uh, that's the objective. But usually when we talk about security in everyday language, we're talking about security practices. We're talking about uh, airport scanners. We're talking about locks. We're talking about the military, the intelligence. And the problem is that these two don't, often don't fit together. You, what I found really fascinating thinking about this is that this difference in understanding of security is actually reflected in the academic literature. So on the one hand, there's a strand of literature that is concerned with the objectives of security, and that's the whole discussion about human security, about you know, do we do national, human, planetary security, and security from what? Is it from climate change? Is it from war? Is it from poverty? That's one set of literature. And then there's another set of literature that deals with security practices. And for example, a very important strand of that literature is the literature on securitization. The idea that when you perform security, you're saying something about political power. In the Cold War, when we observed military exercises on the East German plain, it was a way of telling us that the worst threat to our security that could possibly happen would be another war, and we w should be grateful to our governments who were preparing and to protect us from another war. And it was an idea that did, in a sense, keep us safe. It gave us a sense of security. And I think there's a problem with both of these schools of thought, because the people who talk about objectives assume somehow that the state or international institutions are a deus ex machina. If you can only just persuade them to adopt human security, for example, they will then magically find the institutions and the tools in which to achieve human security. But the problem with the other sort of way of thinking, the securitization way of thinking, is that while it draws our attention to the deep-rooted power relations that underpin security, it doesn't tell us how to deal with the real security problems that we face today, whether it's wars in places like Syria and Yemen, organized crime or terrorism. So, you know, so how do we solve that dilemma? And, and, and really, I developed the notion of a security culture as a way to bring together objectives and practices. So the reason that regular armed forces aren't much use when people are feeling insecure is that they're not designed to make individuals more secure. They're designed to face a fight against other states. And the problem is that ways of doing security are so deeply embedded that it's extremely difficult to adapt security cultures. So just to tell you a little bit more about this concept and then to say something about different types. Uh, I, I was very influenced by the term in the strategic studies literature, which is strategic culture. And the term strategic culture was developed in the 1950s by strategists at the Rand Corporation. These were people who were imagining a nuclear war and were drawing up elaborate plans of what, Russia, what the Soviet Union will do if we do this and what we will do as though it were a chess game. And what they couldn't understand was why did the Soviet Union not behave the way they predicted? <laughs> so they invented the concept of strategic culture to explain 
why different, uh, different countries or different powers do security differently. Um, and nowadays, there is quite a lot of literature about whether the EU has a common strategic culture. So my concept of security culture differs from this notion in three ways. First of all, I'm, the strategic culture was very much about how you do military. It was about military culture. And security may not be about military nowadays. You know, whether you're talking about internal security, which is about policing or uh, development security, it, it, you know, security doesn't have to be about the military. So that's the first difference. The second difference is that it's functional rather than ethnic or territorial. In other words, it's about a way of doing security rather than about the British or the um, Soviet way of doing security. And um, so, for example, uh, people in the Pentagon and people in the Russian Ministry of Defense who both espouse a geopolitical model of security have much more in common with each other than they do with the peacekeepers or the humanitarians who people what I call the liberal peace security culture. So it's functional. It's a sort of social idea of culture. And the third big difference is that it's not an essentialist view of culture. It's a constructed view of culture. So the strategic culture theorists tended to be essentialist. You know, they would say, well, Britain has naval power because Britain's always had naval power. <laughs> um, you know, Britain's a maritime power, and so they've always chosen to emphasize their navy. And um, in exactly the same way when you talk about ethnic culture, there are those essentialists who say, I don't know, in the Balkans it's ancient rivalries or whatever, it's deeply embedded in culture. In fact, the key point about this notion of culture is that it's constructed and it has to reproduce itself and it reproduces itself through budgets, through political debates, through actual contingencies. And what's useful about thinking in that way is that you can identify pathways, and in those pathways you might find openings, divergences, experiments that offer you alternative routes. So I think that's a very important aspect of the culture notion. So what I do in the book, which I'm not gonna do now because it would take far too long, is to try to provide genealogies of different security cultures, how they evolved, how they developed, how they're changing, because the idea is that security cultures are constantly in flux. So what I do in the book is that I define four broad types of security cultures. They're not exclusive and one could think of others, but they're broadly descriptive of the current security landscape. And I think what's absolutely key is this insight from the securitization scholars that different security cultures are embedded in different sets of power relations. Each of my security cultures are linked to a different type of political authority. Um, and also what they imply for this inside-outside distinction. So what am I for? Well, the first one I've already talked about is geopolitics. Geopolitics is when the objective is national security, when the means are regular military forces um, and aimed at defending borders or trade routes or whatever. And geopolitics is linked to the emergence and the development of the nation state and to blocks of nation states. And um, it is still the case that geopolitics is the dominant security culture today. 
Most defence budgets are focused on geopolitics. Most narratives, if you, any of you study international relations, that's always going to be about the Soviet Union versus China. There's a geopolitical discourse that dominates the way we think about these issues. Um, and that's, and in theory, geopolitics is very much an outside. Uh, kind of security policy, although that's not how it works in practice, but for reasons of time, I'm not going to go, go there. So that's the first one. The second one is what I call new wars. Um, and it's odd to call that a security culture, I know, but actually calling understanding contemporary wars as a culture <laughs> rather than a geopolitical contest is actually rather helpful. Um, so new wars, the objectives are capturing state power and resources and the means are networks of state and non-state actors. Bits of regular forces, militias, warlords, criminal gangs and the like. And um, we tend to think of war as a deep-seated political contest um, between sides, between states, in the case of a geopolitical war, or between a regime and re rebel, as in the case of a civil war. But actually, if we look at contemporary bouts of violence in places like Syria, Yemen, the DRC, what we observe is numerous armed groups, a sort of social condition, numerous armed groups who gain not from winning or losing, but from violence itself. They either gain politically because they espouse extremist ideologies that are based on fear and exclusion, or they gain economically because they finance themselves through loot and pillage and through crime, which is um, possible smuggling which is possible in these conditions of disorder. And they're a culture because they learn from each other, they're connected to each other, they develop technologies and so on. So I think it's actually quite useful to think about new wars as a culture. And of course, this is both an inside and an outside culture. It's both global and local. The third security culture is the liberal peace, which I already mentioned. And um, it's associated basically with intergovernmental institutions. And it emerged originally as an alternative to geopolitics. Numerous philosophers came up with international peace schemes and they envisaged peace, not as domestic peace, but as peace between nations. What we have domestically could vary, uh, but what was key was peace between nations. What we saw after the end of the Cold War was a dramatic growth in the liberal peace, which was seen as a way of addressing the new wars. And we saw a huge growth in UN peacekeeping, in multilateral agencies, in NGOs, the whole kind of complex of things that make up the culture of the liberal peace. So the liberal peace goal is stability, understood as peace between states, and its means is this whole developing complex of peacekeepers, international agencies, NGOs, and so on. I think the big problem with the liberal peace has been its origins in that the liberal peace is still based on the assumption that war is a contest between two sides. And the centerpiece of the liberal peace is the peace agreement. And the, the peace agreement is treated like old fashioned peace treaties where the sides that sign the peace treaty are legitimate organizations. And the problem with that is that actually where you're dealing with a new wars culture you actually, all you do is to legitimize the actors of the new wars culture, and you may reduce the level of violence, but you sustain the culture of new wars, the predatory extremist uh, social condition. Um, 
and I call this I call this situation hybrid peace. In other words, it's a lot better than war. It is a sort of peace, but it's an uneasy, dysfunctional peace. And I think Bosnia probably represents the best example of that. In fact, Bosnia is the poster child for the liberal peace. Everyone celebrates the Dayton Agreement, which actually legitimized the ethnic warlords in Bosnia. And, you know, we've spent so much money in Bosnia, more money per head than the martial aid. We've deployed large numbers of troops. And despite all that, Bosnia is a hugely dysfunctional society, uh, which could return to war at any time with high levels of unemployment. Um, and that's the best. Bosnia is the best. The worst, of course, is Syria, where a peace agreement is just not possible. <laughs> and actually, you end up, well, I'm going to say something in that in a minute. You end up with something very similar to Bosnia. It looks like Assad is technically winning. The regime theoretically controls more of the country now than anybody else. But actually, it's presiding over a new war's culture. It's a very different society than it was before the war. So it'll end up looking a lot like Bosnia, I think. Maybe worse. Um, and then the final security culture that I want to mention, although I'm not going to talk about it at length, is the war on terror. Uh, and the war on terror, like new wars, is both inside and outside. I think the war on terror represents an evolution of geopolitics to something new. Uh, and it's something new in technological terms, but also in terms of infrastructure. The difference between the war on terror and geopolitics is that it's a war, uh, it's the war of the manhunt. The threat is not a nation state, the threat is individuals and groups of individuals. And it started out of the geopolitical response that Bush took to 9-11, treating the, uh, what happened on 9-11 as an attack on the United States rather than, say, a crime against humanity, which then led him to t make a military response. But it's developed into a very particular form of long-distance assassination on a huge scale, um, which is, uh, which, uh, which is linked to an infrastructure that's very different from a classic military infrastructure. It involves intelligence agencies on a massive scale because of the use of algorithms to identify the people. It involves special forces. It involves drones, of course. Um, so it's very different. And in power terms, I think you could say it was originally linked to American exceptionalism. <laughs> Uh, but increasingly now, of course, it's being spread by other countries. So I, I just wanted to make a pointer to that, that in a sense, the new wars and the war on terror are the most, the sort of new types of security cultures that are around at the moment. So now let me finally turn to the European Union <laughs> and how do we describe the EU's security culture? And how will it shape and be shaped by the nature of the EU as an institution? Now, as we often say, the European Union is actually neither an intergovernmental organization nor a state, although it's a bit of both. <laughs> it's based both on treaties and elements of constitutionalism. Uh, what I would like to say, to argue, is that I think the EU could involve, evolve into a new type of political institution that I would call a model of global governance. Um, it, I'm not saying it will, I'm just saying it could. <laughs> and what do I mean by a model of global governance? Well, I mean a sort of institution that is not a state, but it restrains the worst aspects of statehood, namely war and repression. <laughs> and it's an institution that, as it were, civilizes or tames globalization. It restrains or taxes or regulates global bads like climate change, financial speculation, extreme inequalities, and so on. 
and it promotes global goods like peace, renewable energies, um, ending extreme poverty, and so on. Um, and evidently, whatever security policy that the EU adopts is absolutely critical in whether it can be such an institution, not only because security is at the heart of power relations, and we trust our institutions if they, we think they keep us safe, but also because the conflicts that are going on that I, in Syria, in Libya, in our neighborhood, and even are, if you like, the sharp end of the bads of globalization, and if we can't deal with them, then there's a very grim prognosis. So, as you all know, um, CSDP dates back to 1999, in San Malo when Tony Blair agreed with Jacques Chirac that Europe needed a security policy. Up to that time, Britain had been a big obstacle to any joint security policy. And as you all also know, Javier Solano was appointed the first high representative for common foreign and security policy and had to develop a security strategy. And as Werner told you, um, I became the convener of a study group that was initially called the study group uh, to, uh, for, I can't remember what we called it, something about European security capabilities. That was our, that was the terms of the study group and the members of the study group were chosen jointly by myself and Dr. Solana. And as Van already told you, our first report was published in 2004, and it was called A Human Security Doctrine for Europe. And actually, we, we worked out what the doctrine should be, and then we said we had to give it a name. And we had a lot of discussion among us all, and we decided to give it the name Human Security. Then, of course, we thought we'd better read all the literature on human security, and we went back and discovered its origins in the 1994 UNDP Development Report and the whole debates that were going on between the Canadian version and the UNDP version. And what we realized was that our version was distinct from all of those. So I want to explain what, what was distinctive about our version and why did we think it was so appropriate for the European Union. Um, basically, when human security is defined, it's usually defined as actually you defined it. People say it's the security of the individual, and the communities in which he and she live rather than the security of the state or the security of borders. That's the first element. The second element is that it's not only security from fear, it's security from want. And certainly the original UNDP thinkers were trying to make the argument that after the end of the Cold War, more and more resources should be devoted to development because it was the lack of development that provoked wars, and that's why development should be seen almost as a security issue. Actually, our definition was something a little bit different, although in fact it encompasses both those. Human security is what we enjoy in a rights-based law-governed society like Austria or Britain. When something terrible happens, a terrorist attack, a fire, um, I don't know, a disaster of some kind, we expect there to be secure, uh, emergency services, firefighters, police, um, medical staff to come to our help. And what we meant by human security was essentially that Europe will be secure if this kind of rights-based law-governed society is extended globally. That was our understanding of human security. And um, I think that in fact, even though it was only with the global strategy, as Werner pointed out, that the actual term human security was adopted, if you look at the actual missions of the European Union, 
a lot of that was in it, and, I, and that's what made it a little bit different from classic liberal peace. It was definitely part of the liberal peace, but it was a little bit different. There was a big emphasis on law and policing in all of the EU missions. And, you know, if you look at one or two of the successful missions, there haven't been that many, but nevertheless, it's kind of interesting. I mean, one was Operation Artemis in 2003 in Eastern Congo, where the European sent a force which actually stopped a massacre from happening. Another, I think, has been the anti, which isn't talked up a lot, has been the anti-piracy mission in the Gulf which really has dramatically reduced the level of piracy and has been a human security mission in the sense that it's involved policing rather than war fighting and that it's involved all kinds of development projects like fishing licenses for Somali fishermen. Um, so, um, so I think, of course, that you know, there are huge limitations on EU missions, and I could talk about that at great length, <laughs> but I'm not going to. But they both, both because of the inadequacy of EU capabilities and because of political will. I mean, most of the missions that I've looked at have been, become hugely problematic as a result of lack of political will, that at the political level, uh, the EU is torn between being a junior partner to the United States, being pursuing nationalist interests, or pursuing human security. But human security isn't understood as a political objective, except, it, except in a very few instances, which I've just mentioned. So three years ago, we reconvened the study group. Um, at that time, Javier Solana himself became the co-convener with me of the study group. When he retired, he said, could I join your study group, which was really nice of him. And we reconvened to make a contribution to the global strategy that Werner talked about. And we produced a report which was entitled From Hybrid Peace to Second Generation Human Security. And um, actually, it, it's been published now as a book with all the background papers that we commissioned for it. And we presented this to um, the External Action Service and to Mrs. Mogherini. And a great deal of what we put in that report was actually adopted in the global strategy. So I'm not going to talk at length because I see time marching on about what was in it, but just very briefly. I mean, hybrid peace I've already explained to you, <laughs> and that has really been largely the consequence of liberal peace missions, including missions from the European Union. Um, so what we meant by second generation human security was trying to think about human security in a practical sense in terms of implementation. And um, I think Again, just to summarize, I mean, what I think we argued was that if you move away from this old-fashioned conception of peace towards a human rights approach, then lots of things become different. Peacemaking, for example, reaching agreements, becomes no longer a sort of top-down effort to bring the armed groups together, but is multi-level and is an attempt to construct legitimate political institutions at local levels as well as at higher levels. And it's an attempt to make sure that the international community attempting this kind of peacemaking recognizes that there are people, groups of people, civil society particularly, who, counter, who try to counter extremist ideologies and predatory behavior that have to be understood as partners in the peacemaking business. Um, in terms of peacekeeping, which is really, if you like, the security element, the emphasis is on very much on the protection of the civilians rather than on fighting an enemy. And that was very much the thrust of what we were saying in the original Barcelona report. And in terms of peace building, there's an emphasis on the need to challenge neoliberal 
uh, policies and create legitimate livelihoods, along with legitimate political authority, absolutely essential is legitimate livelihoods. You can't have a legitimate political authority unless people earn money in a legitimate way and pay taxes. <laughs> and similarly, if people don't have legitimate livelihoods, then they're forced to join militias or to join a criminal gang, and that is just very typical of what happened in Syria. So a lot of what we said, and there's a lot more than I've just summarized, was adopted in the global strategy. And since then, interestingly, the global strategy has actually made a lot of progress, at least in part because of Brexit, because the British were always emphasizing NATO, the geopolitical security culture, and were very dismissive of the European Union. And so there have been big strides particularly in defense cooperation, in developing implementation of the global strategy. Um, and they haven't only been about defense cooperation. There have been all kinds of projects about medical commands, logistics, disaster relief. So it's a very sort of broad canvas on which all these things are developing. Nevertheless, I think it raises some very important questions about the future because this is only about the development of capabilities. I mean, the first question is, with all this emphasis on defense cooperation, are we moving back towards state-based approaches or rather treating the EU as a state and with all the emphasis on border security and keeping out refugees, this is completely going in an opposite direction from the human rights approach. Or, on the contrary, are these defense capabilities, which I believe are necessary for a genuine human rights-based approach in places like Syria or Libya, a, a, a new kind of peacekeeping that isn't like the old peacekeeping about separating the sides, which they don't mind anyway, but is really about protecting people and respecting human rights. Um, and what kind of mission, and are there, is there going to be a politics that will support these kinds of missions? Um, I'm afraid that if this security policy fails, we will see a continued spread of the new wars culture precisely because it's a culture, it reproduces itself. And this is what we've seen in all these places. These wars are really difficult to end, and they tend to spread. And we see the sort of spreading culture in Syria, Yemen, throughout the Balkans. And, um, uh, and you know, I, my fear is it, it affects us as well. It affects us through refugees, it affects us through terrorism, it affects us through organized crime. So if we can't deal with the new wars culture, uh, I, I fear the, we will see the disintegration of the European Union. Um, and I think, but at the same time, no other approach works. Geopolitics doesn't work any longer. Military compellence, as they called it in the old days, doesn't work. The Americans have the most sophisticated, spend the most money on military than any other power on earth, and yet they couldn't maintain, uh, they couldn't bring order and stability to Iraq and Afghanistan. Huge amounts of effort have been spent in bombing ISIS to disintegrating, to dis and uh, with killing of thousands of civilians. And even though ISIS territory has been regained, ISIS is reappearing in the liberated areas. So, and, and again, there's the example of Assad, which I mentioned. You know, to be sure that Russian support for Assad has enabled them to get rid of the opposition in, in large parts of Syria. Yet nevertheless, what they inherit is a country riddled with local militias, all of them engaged in predatory practices, uh, and in which people no longer fear to say what they want, and in which all kinds of repressive things go on. So it seems to me that 
this is actually the human security approach as I've tried to describe it, and it's complex and difficult, is in fact the only practicable approach. That doesn't mean we're going to do it, but it is the only way we can address this situation. So let me conclude, because I can see Werner looking at me. What I have tried to do is to introduce this idea that there are different ways of doing security, which often isn't apparent to people. So how NATO does security in a geopolitical way is extremely different from how the EU does security. And that's what's not properly understood. When people say we want a security policy, they often think they just want EU to replace NATO. But actually, we want a security policy that is a different, on a different model. Um, So it's not only geopolitical approaches that don't work, but the classic liberal peace approaches don't work either. <laughs> uh, the classic liberal peace that doesn't work, top-down agreements either at best achieve Bosnia and at worst what we're seeing in Syria. Um, so I think what we're trying to see is if we could only develop an effective human security policy, this would be a big step towards a different type of political authority, namely neither an intergovernmental, which is liberal peace, nor a nation state, which is geopolitics, nor a super state, which might be the war on terror, <laughs> um, but something else which I would call a model of global governance. And that seems to me what we need, not just for us in Europe, uh, but, to, but as a sort of crucial tool in addressing global challenges. Well, okay, thank you, uh, Mary Calder, for this very uh, interesting talk, um, outlining different concepts of how to think about security, and I think that's actually uh, quite topical against, uh, when we look at it against the framework of the more recent debate, which as I already said, has motivated uh, this talk, where obviously also in the European Union, uh, what you can observe is um, certain attempts to promote what you call the geopolitical version of, of security by, for example, um, speaking about scaling up military budgets for the, in, the, in the European Union or by um, talking about the, the need for border security, border protection, Etc. Um, so I think we are actually really at a very critical moment in this whole uh, debate about the future of um, what could constitute a Euro European uh, foreign and security policy. Uh, but before we enter into that debate in, into, in, in more detail, um, let me also in introduce to you um, our panelist, Ulrich Brandt, who is a professor of political science, international politics, uh, more particularly uh, at the University of Vienna, the Department of Political Science. Ulrich has uh, done a lot of work on um, certain regions of the world, in particular Latin America. So um, he's uh, what I would call an expert on, on Latin American politics. But moreover, he's also been doing a lot of work uh, on political ecology, international environmental politics. Uh, and most recently, he's uh, published a book on the uh, imperialist, imper imperialist mode uh, of living, which has been quite widely discussed in the German-speaking countries. So um, my thought uh, when inviting him was that um, as he is not in, if you want, in the narrower sense, uh, a security specialist, but um, um, a person that is engaged in, in, in other debates uh, of international uh, politics, he might bring uh, a broader perspective um, on, our, um, on our topic. And uh, so uh, I've asked him to make a short comment um, both on the concept uh, uh, of human security and global security cultures as introduced to you uh, by Mary Calder and also on what he thinks uh, are important elements that should be emphasized when speaking about um, security or human security at the international level. So um, short comment by Ulrich and then we'll enter into the discussion here on the panel. Ulrich, please. Yeah, thank you, Werner, and thank you, Mary, for this um, excellent talk and this very, very good condensation of your of your thinking, and I'm also happy that you came to Vienna in these, um, during these exciting days in the UK, and thank you for you uh, for coming. I think the 
the concept of um, human security, we also, it's quite present also here in our teaching and in our research, and it's an excellent <laughs> critique of a too narrow understanding of security, just the absence of war and violence, and that the focus is much more on individuals and on the everyday practices, I come back to this, of insecurity and of the vulnerability of people. Um, and then also, um, I think it's very important in these times to underline that it's also against a ma pure market-driven agenda that you also say the role, the state should play a role. And it's also, as you um, said, a very timely critique and a strong critique of the current uh, remilitarization uh, of politics. So I have three comments, and Werner already said that I'm not, come, don't, uh, I don't come from the, the core of security studies here. Is, um, Wintersteiner, Reutner, Brunner and others in the um, auditorium, they know much better. But um, three brief thoughts and if there's time, maybe a final provocation concerning the EU, the current situation. The first is um, the security cultures. I read now your outline and the, the, the working paper I read um, in preparing my comment that um, you have this typology of the four types um, and um, the strengths of your work I always found was the broad understanding of um, security and insecurity, poverty, exclusion, violence um, in other world regions. And I now find a bit your typology a fallback to be open because you go back to this large picture, to the very, very top-down uh, broad picture and you end up with the, the maybe the least worse is liberal peace and you go a bit beyond with global governance. But I don't see, and please um, you should um, comment on that, I don't see um, the, the, um, the absence of want, this very broad and interesting understanding of, um, of uh, insecurity, um, but it's more, again, the, um, the interstate uh, constellation. I, I hope you got it. What is, what is the, let's say, this broader understanding of insecurity and then of security? And I, with the typology, you go, a bit, I would say, a bit uh, back. And so what is the horizon of a peaceful world? I would say, and you, this is also your criticism of, um, of, um, of the liberal peace um, um, hypothesis and the global governance, what would be, since you are also, an, let's say, a public intellectual, not only a scientist, what goes beyond the thinking of these four types and what is really um, um, a, an, an understanding and a vision of a, of a peaceful world? This brings me to a second aspect. Um, I was always fascinated by your work since the 90s, and I had always one question, and now I can pose it, <laughs> finally. <laughs> Um, so we, ha we have agreement that it's, we, we work on a critical approach to IR and um, yeah, I don't work so much on security studies but maybe in a, in, a, in a broader sense. But I always ask myself why in your analysis the root causes, the causes of insecurity are so downplayed. You, you outline the need the principles in a very, very uh, uh, good way um, of, um, of uh, um, why, we, why we need uh, security structures, institutional ones now, the norms, and uh, let's say the everyday. But what are the root causes? And I would say the root causes of, and um, there, there are universal tendencies of, um, of um, the root causes of insecurity, which we could, um, then we have to, uh, we have to an um, analyze it, but racism, patriarchy, capitalist, um, um, uh, um, the, the capitalist market economy, the principle of cost making at any cost, the destruction of the environment. So this goes hand in hand with an enormous violence. And you, I have always the impression that you start in acknowledging this violence, acknowledging the insecurity, but I would say that if we want to really deal with, the, with, the, with these um, um, uh, causes, we need to analyze them. Just if you, if you can comment uh, on that. Um, yeah, and I, as Werner said, I work on this imperial mode of living, a concept which tries to understand how in the everyday of the, of the global north, but also among the middle classes in the global south, these constant and invisibilized access to resources, to cheap labor, is constituting, to, for, our, for our way of living, for our mode of production, is constituting these courses um, and these um, turmoil in, in other world regions. So, in our, your words, I would say you still focus very much on the demand side of, um, of security. But when I, and, and yet then you say it's the, the access to work. This is a demand. It's stable work relations. It's decent wage. But if, if we look more concretely, what does it mean today that we have in Europe decent wages, stable work, and um, access to work? 
in the automotive sector or in the nuclear energy sector, which uh, on the coal in the, in the, uh, to produce um, power from coal, but what does it mean for other world regions? So my point here is that a certain stability in Europe, a peaceful, a, 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 let's say a deliberate peace in Europe, has a precondition elsewhere, and we need to, we need to um, bring this together. And um, your concept goes a bit back to, to methodological nationalism. Please counter it. It's, of course, it's a comment and it's, it's quite uh, provocative. So how can we understand these, that the global north and Europe with its liberal peace is, um, is uh, menacing and is, is damaging um, other world regions and this is also a cause of, of insecurity and of violence, like the Congo, the Coltan issue, you know much better than I. Just an example um, on wording, but I think it's not only on wording. You, one of your dimensions of, um, of um, human security is food security. And I think this is very important to argue that people need to have a secure life, access to a certain amount uh, of food and a certain, um, um, uh, a certain chance to, to choose so, um, uh, food. But there's another concept, and I, I would say this goes then also to the supply side in your words, which is food sovereignty. Food security is a very, I would say, principle, a very important principle that people have access to food. But how the food is produced? Is it transnational corporations? Is it the, the food industry? Is it the large, large European or U US American um, um, uh, um, uh, agro-business? Or is it, and this is the idea of food sovereignty, is it also small-scale farmers? Is it an ecological form of, um, of food production and so on? Just to, to counter a little bit. So the last part, and then I already go to my, to my um, eight minutes, it's on the EU. Um, you, you outline um, a quite, I would say, ambiguous but positive understanding of the EU. It could be a, a world leader um, on, these, uh, on these issues. In, in global governance, you say it's a model of global governance. I would counter it coming more from inter international political economy. Um, if we understand the EU in the current situation also as an imperial power, as an imperial power in competition with other imperial powers, in securing free trade in Africa or in other countries, in Latin America, in securing the investment security of the, of the, um, EU, the European champions and the, the investors, in securing resource, access to resources, which is called resource diplo diplomacy, but we could also call it resource um, um, imperialism, uh, uh, what, what does it mean? So it comes back to a bit to this, what, are, what is our understanding of the root causes of the problems? Is the EU the potential model for a global governance? I would say maybe, but in fact today it's also an imperial power competing with us. Do I have one minute more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> because you already took the bike. So to finish, what is the EU? And what is the we of the EU? The EU is of course also power driven. It's, 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 a, it's class structured. It's also a gendered uh, structured. And so, and to, to end with this, um, I would go beyond the EU, arguing that the EU in the current state is also an elitist project. And what we need is of course not a nationalist, protectionist disintegration of the EU. But what we, I would argue we need is a selective disintegration of the EU to create space for certain initiatives to enable human security. If we look in the, uh, into the agrarian policies of the EU, which is, a com uh, you know better than I, it's, uh, it's completely driven by the, by the interest of the large companies, not by the small scale farmers. So what we need in this uh, aspect, in this sphere, is a selective disintegration to create a space that we have a much more self-sustained self um, environmental um, uh, um, food production and uh, agriculture in the EU. I could go to other fields. We, we are now, we have Poland and the, 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 the COP24, uh, but um, I, I, would, I would leave it here. So the idea of really a progressive project to secure, uh, uh, you, uh, to, 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 to enhance and to, to stabilize human security would, from my perspective, also mean to, uh, to discuss in more detail a selective uh, disintegration of the EU. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for... Thank you very much for this um, um, comment, which touches upon conceptual issues as, as well as the, the political dimension of, of what you've talked about what the European Union could possibly be and in how far that compares to the actual status quo of the European Union. Um, so um, I give the word to you. So to re first of all, okay? it's a real misreading of mm -hmm. security cultures to think that it's 
linked to the nation state. The only security culture that is linked to the nation state is geopolitics. Um, what I think is true about my concept of security cultures, which was deliberate, is that it's focused on how do we maintain security from large-scale violence. It's focused on conflicts. And I did that deliberately because I feel in all this discussion about freedom from want, about food security, about climate security, there's something left out, which is how do we address violence? I think because people aren't really willing to think about that, they, you know, they tend to uh, overemphasize all these other aspects of security. And I'm not by any means downplaying them, nor am I saying that violence isn't interlinked with all of these things. But my focus was what do we do about large-scale bouts of violence? But it's certainly not about states. I mean, as I tried to explain, the new wars culture is linked. All of the security cultures, that's something special about security, and that's what we learn from the securitization scholars, is that security is very much linked to power relations. But they're different types of power relations. So, Geopolitics is linked to the nation state. New wars are linked to new local hybrid forms of authority. Liberal peace is linked to intergovernmental forms of political authority. And the war on terror, as I pointed out, is linked to a sort of notions of exceptionalism. So that's, I think, the first point I, I want to make. I just disagree that this is statist. The second point is about root causes. I'm very skeptical about the whole literature on root causes because I think what the discussion of root causes does is just to express a particular interpretation of war. And what I'm much more interested in is understanding how violence reproduces itself over and over again. This isn't to say that some of the things people say is root causes, but I always find it so interesting. I mean, I remember when root causes were as its most popular, hearing Condoleezza Rice, then Secretary of State, saying the root cause of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is Hamas. Whereas what people usually mean, root causes is usually meant, are the economic causes. And while I don't disagree that inequality and poverty at least provide the conditions, I think to understand how violence evolves is a much more complex process that is continually reproduced. So it's much more interesting to think about what reproduces violence than what set it off in the first place or what constrains violence. Um, and I think a lot of it, and, and once you have I mean, in the end, your only test of whether you've got a good analysis is whether what comes out of it as a prognosis actually works. Um, so I don't think I talk about food security at all, actually. I mean, certainly it's mentioned because UNDP's definition of human security included food security, but I was expressly uh, saying I, I, I'm not taking the UNDP definition. My definition is, and my vision, yes, you asked me about my vision. Sorry, I haven't answered that bit. My vision is very much of this, that, you know, in contrast to the liberal peace, which was very much about peace imposed from above, in the way that you say, uh, and it was very much an interstate project. My vision is a human rights based, law-governed vision of a peaceful world, that you can only have a peaceful world in a globalized situation in which human rights is broadly respected. So I think human rights is at the center of my vision as opposed to the classic view of peace. Um, now, your point about imperial power, well, of course that's true, but that's one one direction of the European Union. Of course it's true that there's, you know, there are tensions in this project of the European Union. And part of the project was always an imperial project. It was um, 
Churchill who thought, you know, the European Union would be a very good idea because Europe could pool all its colonies and then it would be as strong as the United States and the Soviet Union. And there's always been this elitist power vision of the European Union. But there's also another model uh, vision of the European Union, and that other vision comes out of the reaction to war and fascism uh, and has created a very interesting new political architecture that doesn't really resemble any other political architecture that we've ever seen. And it's that, it's the direction of that, you know, I think we're in the midst of a struggle between an imperial vision and this whatever you want to call it. I call it a model of global governance. I mean, we used to call it a peace project, but actually now I increasingly, what I'm in concerned about is how do we deal with the problems of globalization. Um, and yes, to some extent, the EU is an elitist project, and it's certainly true over the last 20 to 30 years that global corporations have been much more powerful in influencing the European Union than the citizens. But nevertheless, there are whole areas of European policy making where the citizens are actually very effective. Do you know, my favorite example is the abolition of roaming charges which was a citizens initiative brought by a group of French students which allows for cheap communication across the continent and which reduces the profits of big phone companies. So there are examples of that kind and I think the European Union has been rather progressive compared with other powers in the area of digital rights and cyber security. It's got a human rights based policy rather than a national security based policy in climate change where the EU has pioneered. The, I, I don't want to sort of give a big defense because I agree with you that there are huge problems and at the heart of the problem is the neoliberal project of the euro. But where I disagree with you is that partial disintegration will somehow get rid of this imperial project. I think what's got to happen is pan-European citizens' pressure. And I also think what's got to happen is, and, and I think it's quite interesting, that in the policy that we've been talking about, the common security and defense policy, it has actually been one of the areas where civil society has been most effective, oddly enough. You know, going back to Bosnia, where I was very involved with local human rights groups inside the Balkans, you know, it was really possible to transmit their ideas to the European Commission. And the European Commission's always been very open to civil society ideas, which has really influenced the policy in terms of things like the fact that missions are accompanied by human rights monitors, the emphasis on sort of town hall type consultations. So, you know, so what I just feel is that that whole area of pressure has never existed, or at least not since um, Thatcher and the Maastricht Treaty have not been influential in the economic sphere. And there's a tendency for anti-neoliberal economic activists to be nationalist and to think the way to deal with globalization is to go back to the nation state. Uh, whereas for human rights activists and peace activists, it's sort of natural to be internationalist and pro-European. And what we need is some real pressure um, and it may not work because I think it's linked to the success of the, but I think unless we can shift this neoliberal character of the European Union, that's going to be very dangerous for everything else, even though there are positive elements. And I think disintegration would be a disaster, actually, because the EU is all that's left practically in the world <laughs> and on human rights issues. And so what one really needs is public pressure from below. Okay, thank you. Uh, would you like to make a, a short comment on that? We join them? 
No, I think this was quite explicit, and I would say this is exactly in favor of the argument of the selective disintegration. I would also say the EU should maintain its power in human rights issues, in environmental issues. I talked about agrarian issues. In, in environmental politics, the EU is far more uh, progressive than usually now the nation states, but in other, you gave good examples that in favor, I would say, of a, of a selective disintegration. I was not in favor of a complete disintegration. disintegration. Um, the, your first point, you, you're right, I would, my point was with this um, state-centered approach, and you also said that liberal peace is state-centered in a way, and not only the uh, geopolitical approach. My point was, what goes beyond that your lens of the typology is um, a lens of the large picture, and, but the lens of a broad understanding of human security is also the tiny civil society cultural aspects. This was a bit my point, but I think you clarified a bit. Yeah, and, and yeah. it's something I put huge emphasis on, actually. Maybe I didn't yeah. put enough in the talk, yeah. but... <laughs> okay. Um, you know, um, perhaps a little, little additional question from my point of view. Um, here at the Austrian Foundation for Development Research, research we are not you know, um, doing research on security policy, but we're doing a lot of research on development issues and also on, for example, international trade issues. Um, and when you look at what the European Union is doing in development politics and in international trade policies, uh, you can't help the impression that the, uh, the global strategy and the aspirations and the normative concepts underlying the, the global strategy um, are not really, you know, put into practice in, 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 an, in an everyday policy context. So there, is, there are, if you want, um, disalignments, um, disharmony, uh, uh, di disagreements between institutional players, for example, um, and also between the agendas of specific policy areas and policy fields. So uh, when, you, when you look at, as Ulrich already mentioned, when you look at the, uh, um, the commodity policy of the European Union with the raw material strategies, or when you look at the free trade agreements that the European Union is negotiating, for example, with African countries, the economic partnership agreements, um, or when you look at other policy areas, um, I would argue that at the end of the day, um, we have this normative concept, uh, but uh, obviously di diverging interests um, have hold a certain control over, over the specific aspects of the whole ensemble of uh, foreign and external policies of the European Union. Um, so I would, I would certainly um, be in favor of thinking about uh, the global strategy as, as, as a guideline um, and, and for putting that guideline into practice. But as I see the ensemble of external policies, I would argue that what we see at the end of the day is often um, a geopolitical approach or a geoeconomic approach where the European Union pushes through its interest um, vice of I other partners. Um, so, and, and I would argue that although at the institutional level, uh, Mrs. Mogherini, as the High Representative of, for, for External Foreign Policy, is now also kind of managing and steering, say, trade policies and development policies and other areas of foreign policies. Um, it is still a battle um, going on between diverging interests uh, coming from e corporate sectors, other sectors uh, of, the, of society, that uh, often leads to somewhat contradictory results on the ground. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think the real problem with the European Union is the lack of a shared politics, the lack of political engagement. I mean, a lot of people talk about how inadequately democratic the European Union is. Although, actually, I think in procedural terms, it's not bad. I mean, if I look at my own country, Britain, we have this unelected House of Lords. We don't have a constitution. I mean, one of the mo what things that worries me most about Brexit is the only constitution we had was the EU. So we were losing overnight lots of rights because they were only written down through the EU. But leaving that aside, I think the real problem is that there's a lack of political engagement. You know, when the European parliamentary elections take place, they're usually about national politics. People aren't really interested in politics at a European level. There's no European public sphere. And that's what leads to such a fragmentary, uh, interest-based, bureaucratic set of practices. And I think the, the big question for us is how on earth do we 
construct a real European politics where we can debate principle at a political level. Um, hello, uh, my name is Medita. I recently graduated from the LSE, uh, from the International Relations Theory um, Department. And um, I was wondering, um, kind of following up on Mr. Brandt's um, comment that scholars like Barkawi, Rampton, have heavily criticized the hybrid peace and new wars concept and um, kind of following an ahistoricist approach and not really factoring in neoliberal developments and the, the peace complexes, but also reproducing imperialist and uh, post-colonial notions of dominations. Um, so with kind of looking at the picture right now, don't you think that the EU or the yeah European um, politics for um, security as one of the richest or pow most powerful unions that we have or regimes that we have in the world um, acts in a kind of ambiguous manner when investigating into wars um, with heavy weaponry when also kind of exploiting the, still exploiting the global south and building simultaneously building up walls at the European periphery but calling itself a bastion for human rights and democracy. Um, so is that security then? That's my question. And the other question is, don't we have to challenge the term of human security in an epistemological manner? So don't we have to challenge the epistemology behind that? Um, especially the Eurocentric perspective on human security. Okay, thank you very much. Any further questions or comments at this moment? First row? Uh -huh. okay. I have to. We were a bit hidden from each other. I don't know where I should put myself. Yeah. Come to the front. <laughs> uh, my name is Claudia Brun. I'm based at the Peace Studies Center in Klangfurt also. And I want to thank you for the lecture and thank Ulrich Brandt also for this, I think, very important command. And I have like two and a, uh, one and a half comment and, and a question. Um, the question is, since this is largely a development studies um, audience, I would be interested where you put development in your scheme, in your typology. And the one and a half comment is also a kind of skepticism about the typology, because I think they are not as, I do not understand these terms and concepts as distinct from each other as you presented them. I think geopolitics is deeply involved and linked to what we understand by new wars and I think liberal peace has become a very powerful tool for legitimizing the war on terror. So I don't see the distinction as clear as um, you presented it and I'm a bit afraid that this global governance idea might become maybe the fifth of a set of, to my opinion, altogether a bit problematic understandings of what is a culture with security, but I think this links quite much to what Ulrich Brandt said and also the young Madita, I think, the young lady before uh, me. So, and the other, the other half of the comment, or maybe the more important to me since I work on notions of violence is, you mentioned and you made a very strong point on, on that, that we have to address the question of violence, and I fully agree with that, but I think we must extend our notion of violence as well, because in the security appro approach, even if it's human security, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that when you speak of violence, you, you apply quite a narrow term. And I think what Ulrich and Madita um, were speaking about is things that other scholars would call like structural violence, symbolic violence, normative violence, or even epistemic violence. So this is the other half of the one and a half comment. Thanks. So thank you very much. I would suggest that we take two more uh, list, uh, two more speakers on my list, and then we go back to the uh, podium. Mr. Graf and then Mrs. Lugin. My name is Wilfried Graf. I'm, I'm director of the Herb Kellman Institute, here based in Vienna for uh, Kellman Institute for Interactive Conflict Transformation. I will say something for your defense, Ms. Caldor, and then I have also a critical question. <coughs> uh, the defense is that, as I understand you, you are focusing on a specific problem, large-scale violence, what we do about it. And in that regard, the comments were not so much to the point, because we are not so good in dealing with large-scale violence, uh, we from peace studies, development studies, and so So this is a real problem. 
In that regard, then you discuss four, school, four schools of security cultures, and you are arguing that all they are don't, they are not practical, they don't work, with one exception, and this is, is it still a, a, a variant of liberal peace? But it's human, it could be, it it could could be, be yeah? Culture. So it's maybe, maybe type five, security culture number five, uh, focusing on a human rights approach. So security through human rights, but then my question is, isn't human security a little bit too narrow? Is human rights not broader than human security? Is not their freedom, isn't their identity? So this would be one question. But I have, I think you miss a, a, a fifth or sixth culture of security. And this is the culture of peace, security through peacemaking. Uh, so I would propose a broader concept of peace beyond concepts of security. All well, this is important, but there is a broader concept. So you could, you are proposing peace through security, but human security. I am proposing uh, security through peace. Uh, and this is not, of course, not a negative peace. This would be a more broader peace. This would be sec human security through social justice, human security through conflict mediation, dealing with the past, and so on and so on. So, but you know all this. This is the li literature of critical peace research. My question is just why you don't, why you don't mention it. Okay. It's okay. there. Thank you. So. Last intervention from the floor, Mrs. Lugin. Now, I have a very different question from uh, just uh, a question of understanding. Uh, I think for in the last, um, now since a few years, not anymore in fact, but before the, uh, this concept of humanitarian interventions of a war because uh, of this right that uh, to, uh, to um, to intervene in a state because of violation of human rights has sort of dominated also the security debate. Um, the last case was probably Libya with the disastrous consequences we, uh, we have. Um, where do you uh, place it in your concepts? Where do you, um, yeah, where is this humanitarian mm -hmm. intervention in your thinking? Okay, thank you very much. We go back to the um, podium. Uh, Mr. Wintersteiner, refer to the Helsinki Assembly and the ideals of that time and in how far um, you still contemplate upon them. Totally. I think, I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't give you a Helsinki Citizens Assembly type vision, but this was completely my intellectual formation. <laughs> and the notion of human security, which combined peace and human rights and was bottom up and involved civil society, was all, uh, all came out of the Helsinki Citizens' Assembly. So I'm sorry if I gave you a misleading impression and didn't put more of that into my talk. Um, I want to sort of make a general remark about, and it's also linked to the question about humanitarian intervention. I mean, my, I agree with lots of these criticisms of the liberal peace and people saying that the liberal peace is the same as geopolitics and that it's imperial and all of those things. And there's lots of truth in the criticisms. But I think what it actually did was in fact to validate the war on terror. What I think this critical discourse on the liberal peace did was to ex say that all interventions are bad and so we shouldn't intervene anywhere because the liberal peace is just terrible. And I agree with lots of the criticisms as I made clear of the liberal peace. But I think the problem was then it completely discredited the notion that there could be any kind of intervention that really is helpful to human rights. And I think that's how we ended up with Syria, which has no intervention and which has been just such an incredible tragedy. I mean, I'll even make a very controversial point, which is, although I didn't like the intervention in Libya, which consisted of bombing, what it did do was to knock out Gaddafi's heavy weapons. 
And although it also empowered militias on the ground and led to a long-running war, nevertheless, the level of casualties has been nothing like the level of casualties in Syria. So my real point about, so my point really about the critiques, I mean, you, you know, there are all these critiques that human security is a form of imperialism, it's a form of power, but actually if you're a victim in somewhere like Syria, you're longing for a form of power. And the question is, how is power exercised? And my, what I feel has happened as a result of all these uh, radical critiques of the liberal piece is that it's discrediting all forms of power. And, you know, I, I think we need power, <laughs> actually. You know, when Foucault used the term biopolitical uh, to contrast with geopolitical, and when Mark Duffield says human security is biopolitical, yes, of course it's a form of imperialism, if you like, in a very obvious sense. But he didn't actually have a normative view of biopolitics. There are different ways of exercising biopolitics. And in many ways, biopolitics is preferable to geopolitics. So, you know, I think, I think the whole idea of developing the security cultures was precisely to distinguish between the liberal peace and geopolitics. Because if you don't make those distinctions, you end up saying everything, and you can feel very good about yourself saying all forms of intervention are bad, but you're not going to help people in really difficult situations. And that brings me to humanitarian intervention. I mean, as a consequence of the experience in uh, the Balkans, I did strongly support the idea of humanitarian intervention. I thought that when genocide is committed, we have a responsibility to go to the help of people who are being killed. But then we had the Kosovo War. And actually what happened was that bombing was used uh, in a way that actually killed the very people that we were trying to protect. So then I thought, what do we, does that mean we don't do humanitarian intervention? And I think the problem is, and this goes all the way to the language of war and peace and everything, you can't use mean, by its nature, war and military means are violations of human rights. You can't use instruments to protect human rights that violate human rights. That's the problem. And so the whole reason why we developed the human security approach, and that was absolutely central to our discussions at the beginning of the European Union, was that there has to be something that's more like policing than military intervention that can protect people in cases of genocide, but doesn't risk their lives. So both Libya and Kosovo, which are the primary examples of humanitarian interventions, both of them relied on airstrikes. And you can't protect people on the ground with airstrikes. So that was very much, a th you know, so you were using geopolitical approaches for humanitarian purposes. So that was very much the motivation behind developing the whole idea of human security, that there has to be a new way of protecting people on the ground that doesn't involve classic military means. We tend to look at them, we tend to look at the use of force as a black box and assume that once you use force, it's like, it's a geopolitical method of using force, which means trying to defeat an enemy, or it's a, uh, uh, liberal peace way of using force, which means separating two sides, but a human rights way of using force is more like policing. So that's why I got into all of this. Um, now, that brings me to the culture of peace. I mean, I think what I'm trying to say is that peace is treated as the opposite of war. So the language of peace is very much the language of stability from above. I'm not saying it need be, we could redefine peace. But when we, and, and similarly, even the language of protection of civilians, we don't, in a, 
in, in a, inside a country talk about protection of civilians, we talk about law and order. We talk about rights as a way of protecting people. We don't say we just protect civilians. Why shouldn't we protect young men who are combatants? I mean, why do we make this humanitarian distinction between the killing of combatants and the killing of civilians? I'm against all forms of killing. And the problem with war is that you suspend human rights and, you, uh, and it's perfectly allowed to kill combatants. And the problem with peace is that it's about its statist and an alternative to war. Of course there are different kinds of peace. But I would, I'm happier with the language of... Um, all I'm trying to say is that what I'm getting away from is that human security is much more the language of the rule of law uh, where violations of human rights are crimes rather than legitimate acts of war. And what I'm talking about is extending a human rights-based war and using the language of human rights and using the language of law and criminality rather than the language of war and legitimate use of force. Okay, um, there was one question um, on the role of development in all of this. Oh, yeah. yeah I think that's probably the uh, point that was still not responded to. No, and honestly, there's so much that I didn't do in the lecture that I probably should have done, including especially the stuff about civil society, which I'm very committed to. But development, too, is very crucial because I think if we look at the new wars, they are, if you like, a form of neoliberalism in the military sphere. And what you find is typical in the, you know, I do think new wars very much linked to several decades of neoliberalism. Um, you have the very typical conditions in which new, laws, new wars take place are when authoritarian states are opened up to the world through liberalization. And it's both economic liberalization, which includes not only reductions in budgets, so reductions in public services, privatization, which means turning state-owned companies into a sort of form of crony capitalism, um, but also a kind of transactional politics which is very much associated with the decline of taxation and increased dependence on borrowing and on other forms of rent, uh, so that you get a new kind of politics associated in, in these situations where politicians are more concerned about access to resources than they are about political programs. Um, and that is combined with big, large degrees of inequality, very often with rural unemployment um, and uh, big migrations from countryside to town. And these are very much the economic conditions in which new wars take place. I don't describe them as root causes. I'd rather say they're the economic conditions because I think why new, new wars take place is because of bargaining around, of politicians around money <laughs> and the exploitation of violence, rhetoric and ideologies. But they are the conditions. And I also think very much linked to that is political liberalization. Nearly all the new wars that I'm familiar with start with big mass protests, uh, demands for democracy. That's what happened in Syria, it's what happened in Ukraine, it's what happened in the Balkans. And what happens is that in the effort to these demands for democracy get channeled into identity-based wars. So what you get both Ukraine and Syria are very similar in this respect. You get the regime saying, oh, these are Sunnis or these are ethnic Ukrainians who don't like Russians or whatever. And actually what you see is that the people who turn to violence aren't necessarily the same as the people who participate in the protests. In Bosnia, 
for example, the, peop the unemployed young men who joined the new Bosnian militias were not necessarily the same people as those who took part in the democratic protests. And similarly in Syria, of course some people who took part in the democratic protests in Syria did actually join armed groups. But the vast majority of the people who participated in the demonstrations argued that violence uh, was not they could never win by violence, that they would always be defeated if they adopted violent means. And, uh, but what happens then is that these new groups get formed, you get the development, and these guys who were part of the demonstrations and the protests become civil society. They start being the first groups of people to help their local situations, they're the first responders in humanitarian terms. They mediate local ceasefires. They help keep schools and hospitals going. They document war crimes. Um, and um, of course, they're the first targets. They're the first that get to leave. You know, people said that Bosnia was not just ethnic cleansing, it was intellectual cleansing. The same is true of Syria, where, you know, it's the intellectuals that left. I think the difference between Syria and Bosnia is that in these cases, um, in the case of Syria, precisely because there hasn't been an international uh, intervention, civil society, and because it was a very developed and well-educated society, civil society still goes on, even though it's been battered and still operates. But, and of course, part of their demands, I'm now back, I, I sort of veered off from development and started talking about political liberalization, but of course, very key, you know, I think finding, thinking about the economics of this situation is also actually the way to bring about a new approach to development. People talk about reconstruction, but actually reconstruction can't be a reconstruction of what happened before. And it's not like reconstruction in the aftermath of the Second World War where you reestablish states and you just poured money in. That doesn't work because these are dysfunctional societies and the money that you pour in goes into the pockets of the warlords. So rethinking development is really about rethinking the relationship between the state and the citizen, the role of taxation, the role of different sources of revenue, the ways in which you can create value-adding economic activities which both give people a legitimate livelihood and at the same time become a source of revenue on which to base your local political authorities. So development is a very key element of thinking about all this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we still have room for a short round um, of interventions from the floor. Are there any questions which have not been yet posed and uh, people who would like to pose those questions? Or come back to me. Or come back to you. Because obviously some of the answers might have triggered some uh, mental responses or emotions. Uh, so this is your last ch chance to... I, re I realize I didn't answer the question of the lady who asked me about different types of violence. And of course I agree with you that there are all kinds of different types of violence and including different types of physical violence. There's domestic violence, there's criminal violence, there's political violence, there's terrorism. Um, but all I'm really trying to say actually, and all of these forms of violence are very interconnected and I believe that very strongly and I think it's really important to look at all these different sorts of violence. But I'm just trying to solve a really knotty problem which is how on earth, what do you do with situations like Syria, Yemen, I don't know, how do you address them? And that's why I suppose I focus on physical violence while recognizing all the limitations of that. 